Welcome to the Thrive Master Show. On this episode, we have Rene Rodriguez. Rene is entertaining, but he is not an entertainer. His clients describe him as powerful, thought provoking, and authentic. They say things like, you could hear a pin drop as everyone was captivated. Rene's engaging speaking style, backed by a scientific approach, makes him a top rated speaker at every event. For more information about Rene, go to crenespeak.com. Rene, welcome to the Thrive Master Show. How are you? Good to, good to be here. I'm great. Glad to have you on. My first question is, if you had to take all the wisdom and success and make a master class, what would it be on? Well, I, it, that was my attempt with creating the Amplify course that we do, where we teach, we take 10 people at a time for two and a half day, three day, very intensive experience to what we call amplify their influence through their own personal storytelling combined with value proposition, creation, and self-exploration to be able to deliver a message or communicate an idea in a way that not only people listen to it, but actually can act upon it. Wonderful. Now, is this in person and is it happening online now as well? Both actually. Yeah. We were in person uh, doing it. Then when they canceled the MBA and the pandemic hit, we took about six months to convert it and create a virtual version of it where we do it over five sessions that are three and four hours each. And so it's, it's, um, we've come with the science and everything we've done with it. It's actually just as transformational and more relevant because people are having meetings the way that we are right now, virtually. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So now we'll get back to your zone of genius. Let's go back and connect some dots. Uh, where were you born and what stands out for you? Well, I was born in, in Miami, Florida and, and currently live in Minnesota right now. Mm -hmm. And when you say what stands out, what do you mean? Uh, I'm talking about from your childhood. Yes. Oh, what, from my childhood. Um, <clears throat> I think for, for me, I, probably why I do what I do today is I was the, the kid that had ideas and, and wanted to share things or wanted and just nobody seemed to listen when I talked and it was you know I want, whether it's you know what game we wanted to play as a kid or the girl that you wanted to, that, that liked that you liked the childhood experience of of an idea is an interesting one because I think it follows and that's something I've been thinking a lot about is this what is this journey of an idea and the childhood experience of being able to communicate or not communicate an idea and it's it's as simple as sometimes you know, influencing a teacher to see that you're trying hard or influence a coach to, to get you to play a game or that you're in the game versus, you know, as we get older in high school, <clears throat> it's, it's different as well. And how do you influence a certain direction? And then you get into college, how do you get interviews and, and get uh, selected for a job? And then when you're getting the workforce a little bit older, how do you influence your ideas to grow a business or whether you're a leader, how do you influence uh, people to follow a vision? If you're a spouse or, or a parent, how do you get your influence your kids to stay away from drugs and alcohol, to brush their teeth and eat clean? I mean, the, the journey of an idea is an interesting one. And I remember as a kid, it was really a very lonely experience to not be able to communicate an idea and have people hear it. Mm -hmm. Now, did the, this get nourished with brothers or sisters or from your parents or just the way you are? Well, not, I didn't know my father growing up, and so and my mother worked a lot, so it was it was a lot of external, I guess, a, a lot of different influences that that contributed to that for me. Mm -hmm. So then, going forward, it seemed like you were maybe in the wrong space at the time. The kids didn't understand. When did it start clicking? Was there a, maybe in your later years? Well, I don't know if it was in the wrong space. It was actually probably a, the best experience ever because it gave me such an insight and, and the empathy to understand what it feels like to not be able to communicate something. And mm -hmm. what I tell people is influence is one of the greatest of human experiences. To share something and to watch people not only engage with it but act upon what you're saying, I think is truly one of life's greatest experiences. And conversely to that, it's also the lack of being able to influence people is probably one of life's worst experiences. And somebody asked me why I say that, and it's because it comes down to one word, significance. If we if people are listening to us and we're heard and people are acting upon what we say, we feel significant because we're av having an impact on the world. And conversely, if we are not being heard and what we say isn't having an impact on the world or those around us, we feel insignificant. 
And so influence to me in that journey of the idea is about feeling significant in this world and making an impact. Mm -hmm. So now would you say the idea is like the seed that you plant and then from there you have to add the skills to be able to well, think, that to other people? Yeah, well, I think I think we have to define what an idea is. And, and I, I use the term very broadly, okay. you know, because people will say, well, ideas are, are a dime a dozen, execution is priceless. Of course, we, we know that an idea that's not acted upon doesn't mean anything. I'm not referring to that in, in essence, but everything does be, begin with an idea first. <clears throat> Without the idea, there's nothing to execute. And so let's not demonize the, the process of ideas, but sometimes you have to influence the idea of executing, right? Execution is an idea as well. It's a communication of an expectation. It's saying this is what success looks like. And when you aren't, people don't understand the fullness of what you're trying to communicate, then that's where I think it's, things get, um, get sidetracked, if you will. Okay. So now going forward, where would you say that uh, you've had the most practice where you've made your ideas come to life? <clears throat> where have I had most practice? I mean, being a keynote speaker, I guess you, you get a lot of practice being in front of groups. And after 23 years of doing it, you realize very quickly what works and what doesn't work <laughs> because mm -hmm. an audience will tell you that's one of the best things about doing what I do is that you get immediate feedback. Either the audience is disengaged or don't like it, or they'll boo you off stage, or they clap, write, and take notes. And you realize there's an immediate feedback from a large population of, of people that an idea is resonating. And so I think that whenever you have an opportunity to, to communicate or influence from the front of the room, or whether it be in a meeting or a group of friends, or if you have the opportunity to be on a stage of some sort, that is one of the greatest places to, to be able to learn if an idea is taking flight or not. Now, how did you get into the keynote speaking? Was it somebody that got you in that or business-wise? You know, it, it was something that I always wanted to do because I was a fan of a lot of the train, the, the speakers, the Tony Robbins, Jim Rohns, and Tom Hopkins, Zig Ziglar's, um, Benjamin Zander. You know, there's some a lot of really amazing speakers out there, and I was thrust into it um, by need. You know, I I worked. I used to work for my mother and her her consulting business, and <clears throat> after 9/11, we lost almost the entire business because of uh, just the price of oil went higher, and so clients had to cancel the work they were doing with us, and she ended up having a couple strokes during that time and wasn't able to communicate as effectively as she used to. And so that really forced me to start introducing her and getting in front of the room and doing that sort of stuff. And so that sort of journey led me to being more and more in front of a room. My background in, in direct sales, selling cookware door to door helped a lot because I was used to presenting in front of people. And when I say presenting in front of people, two couples to, to up to five couples, so 10 people, but doing that through in college for four years really helped gain, you know, helped me gain confidence in communicating an idea of buying a very expensive set of cookware. Once again, that's like the immediate feedback that you're getting from that direct sales there as well. Yeah. Either they buy or they don't. <laughs> yes. Recently I heard, um, I don't know if you know of Stephen Kotler. He said all elite performers know it is crawling, walking, and then running. What would be the public speaking, uh, uh, crawling, walking, running? Is that just like get some practice in first? And, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there, you can't skip the learning curve in anything in life. Yes. Anybody who wants to skip it doesn't understand that it's a process. People say overnight success. Yeah, it took 20 years. Yeah. No, there's, there's no overnight anything and anything and anything of value shouldn't be overnight. There's a beautiful journey that people go on. My son is learning to play the piano and he's three, three years in and he's playing some Mozart. He's playing some Beethoven now and he sounds pretty good. He doesn't sound amazing at all, Yeah. but he's three years in and he's sounding okay. Yeah. He doesn't sound like you wouldn't put him on a stage. You wouldn't put him in a group, but he's enjoying the process. And you know, speaking is the same thing. You, people, they get calls all the time, say, I want to get a speaker. What should I charge? I go, nothing. Speak for free as often as you can all over the place. Why, if you can get money, great. But yeah. if, if getting money will stop you from being on that stage, you're losing because you're losing the opportunity to practice something. I spoke for free for years everywhere that I can. And even today, 
we can demand sometimes up to twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars for an hour keynote. Even we're getting that close to that virtually. But if the right event is there, and I get good practice on a new idea, I might take it. Like for example, even this podcast. Like what people say, why? Why would I take podcasts on? I said, well, it helps me flush out ideas. It helps me test what I'm thinking. It helps me, you know, talk through what's current in my mind. And it it's just one of those things that I've always. Uh, enjoyed and people say, "Well, you charge for your podcast." I, I don't know. I, to me, I, it doesn't it doesn't resonate right now. To me, I love the idea of collaborating. You know, I see what you're trying to do with with Thrive Masters and trying to get good ideas out in the world. That fits my mission in helping ideas, you know, come to life. And so, I think you got to fall in love with the process of learning mm -hmm. and failing. <laughs> There's a similarity to what com comedians go through. They, they go to their uh, local place, they practice, and then they do a show on, on a bigger stage, right? You're 100% you're, you're right. I was going to say it. I don't usually say it, but it's, it's my open mic night. That's it's, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's when you get a chance to practice. And, and you know, literally, I was on the phone at, at 5.30 this morning with somebody talking about the journey of an idea. And what does that mean in the journey and the experience as a child? And, and that's what we're talking about here today. And so that process... A lot of times I'll tell people, you'll see me present something on a stage with maybe a couple thousand people there and the, they'll, they don't realize that I have flushed that idea out maybe two to 300 times prior to that moment or maybe for two to three years that idea has been sitting with me before I bring it to something like that. But so few people are willing to give it the two to three years with just one thought or one concept and flush it out over and over and over. And a good comedian's gonna try out, their, they try a joke out one time. I've seen some of the best in their open mic night and they say something, go, okay, that joke didn't work. All right, let me go, they, they literally will take a note right there on stage and say that note didn't work, or that, that joke didn't work. And I love that process because nothing happens overnight. Nothing is an immediate success. And it's a process that you have to learn to enjoy and embrace. Yes. I was talking to my older son yesterday and he was talking about something, how it was hard. Oh, it, we were practicing tennis and he said, this is hard. And then I said, okay, let's take a moment of anything that you like in this world. It took hard work for somebody to create it. Nothing that came easy has come into this world that you enjoy or that, that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I have to it's, remind him. <laughs> it's a labor of love. That's right. It definitely now, is a labor of love. Speaking of comedians, do you have any favorite ones? I do. Yeah. I do a lot, actually. Um, let's see. Bill Burr is one of my favorites for sure. Uh, I think that he has really mastered the art of <laughs> riding a line of controversy and yes. what he feels. Do I always believe in everything he's saying? No, but do I think that he really has... He's able to say things in such a creative way that everybody can listen to them, and I think it's good. Um, Greg Giraldo, rest you know, he rest in peace. He he was one of my favorites. He passed away a few years ago. Uh, I think Pete Davidson as a stand-up comic is coming up to be one of one of the greats. Um, let's see who else is uh, Sebastian Maniscalco. I think is oh, is genius. Wow. The um, yeah, there's there's so many there's so many good ones right now. Um, yeah. I, they're not they're not coming to mind right now but i i, I love watching because you you learn co you learn timing with from comedians there's a timing involved in being able to communicate an idea there's also a sequencing in how they tee up a joke mm -hmm. and when you can follow the process and the methodology that they use you start realizing that there really truly is a science it's not just going out there and talking but there is a process to communicating an idea to being able to influence somebody to creating they manufacture laughter they open loops in the beginning and then they leave that joke alone for 20 minutes and they'll come back and close it at the end and you go, oh my gosh, that matched the beginning and it's so funny and it feels so whole and together. And you can do the same with a talk where you can leave something, you start with something, but you finish with what you started and it feels like a full journey, a full circle and it feels complete. No different than a song starts in home key and ends in home key. You know it's over because it goes back to home. And a journey, a story, everything, when it feels circular that way, becomes it really just it, it it lands differently. Yes. Now let me ask you, where you are today? Was it something that you designed? You had a vision for a decade ago? Did you take the steps towards where you are? Was it was it a process? 
or is it just something that has evolved naturally, so to speak? Uh, I, when you say where I am today, I feel like I'm in the journey today. And I think I'll feel like I'm in the journey in 10 years and then in 20 mm -hmm. years. And, uh, I don't know if I, I buy into the feeling like something has arrived, you've arrived to something. I think that we're only alive during our journey. And so I tell this to my kids, I tell everybody, you got to enjoy the process. You got to enjoy the journey from here to there. Because if you start saying, well, once I do this, then once I have my book written, then well, once, I mean, I used to say, gosh, if I can get on that stage, then life will be great. Well, I got on that stage. I'm like, well, <laughs> once I can learn how to tell the story better then. but once I get to this place, I'll be really cool. But once I, once I, and, and then you never enjoy the process. And so right now, am I on the journey and on the track that I want to be? Absolutely. Do I do what I love every day? Are there parts of my day that I hate that help me do what I love? Absolutely. You know, I love speaking and I do a hundred events a year and in because of the pandemic, I did over 300 virtual events in the last 11 months. Do I love those? Yes. But very rarely am I actually ever on stage, even though you do 300 events. Yeah. It's so it's, it's one of those things that you have to enjoy the process. And like right now I'm re relearning research that I've been talking about for 23 years that now is considered a myth and debunked. And so I got to re rehash 23 years of my life going, what does that mean? Is the research debunked or is it now just a metaphor that still functions? Do I have to look at, you know, was there something that I was missing? And, but that's the process of learning, you know, neuroscience. And so we talk about, you know, I, the brain is one of the things that is what I would say sets me apart and being able to do this virtually, you know, being able to create an experience virtually is there. But the, the process of being able to enjoy the, the journey is to me what's most exciting, you know? And so I think that that is what we're trying to, to get people to understand is that there is a, a process to it. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the process, I want to acknowledge from the outside, you know, I, I've been watching you guys transition virtually. Can you talk about what it took and, and when was the decision made? Okay, you know, we got to go and make this happen. Yeah, uh, it was right when the NBA canceled. It was March exactly one year ago yesterday is when I, I made the post where I, I pulled my camera crew together and we had 100 events that all basically had canceled. And we were sitting here with nothing. And I said, well, we have to learn how to do this virtually. And we have to learn what all of this means. And I was doing what I thought was a very innovative video where I put my iPad up and I was using a con remote control for my iPad to start and stop videos. <laughs> and I didn't understand lighting. I didn't understand the importance of a camera. I didn't understand the importance of a microphone that we're using right now. Mm -hmm. And so now, one year later, I'm sitting in a you know thirty, forty thousand dollar studio that used to be my office, and I can make you know the brain pop up. We can change the backdrops right now. I literally mm -hmm. could drop this backdrop here, and you'll see a completely different backdrop mm -hmm. that changes the entire game. And so, the, and also have another studio. Mm -hmm. Is right there, and so the even right what you're seeing right now is a new one because I have a bl black pop up that goes here. So we're playing with some lighting on the floor. This is all experimental. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's going to continue to be that way. So you made it work. So now let's talk about Amplify. Can you talk? about what you do during a one day or three day events that uh, you take people through? Yeah, absolutely. So Amplify is the full expression, I think, of what, what it is that I love and I'm passionate about. And so Amplify is taking 10, 10 people who are very serious about improving their communication style and also courageous enough to get real-time feedback in a very intense fashion. And so I don't believe in all right, try this out. Next time you're up here, I say, nope, stop what you're doing. You said, um, four times. Let, let's do it. Nope, you, you're three ums in again. Let's start over. And creating the stress level for people to start fixing things. Because what, ha what, what matters most is when people are under stress, who do they become? And that, that, that we, we try to show the difference between skill and attribute. A skill is something you train for. You train for a skill under a certain scenario. But there are certain parts of life that you didn't train for. And if you don't have the skill set, then your attributes come out to play. And sometimes your attributes serve you well. Sometimes your attribute is that you become very focused and quiet and very, and very engaged. Some people's attribute is they get very stressed and they start to blame and they become irrational. Or they just, they, their, their stress is too high. And so we want to really reveal the attributes that they have through stress so that we can fix it there. And then they go on to learn uh, what we call the Amplify formula, which is a three-step process for communicating an idea and creating influence. They learn about what the concept called framing. 
and the importance of framing. And framing is the little things that come up, the frames of reference that come up when we hear certain words. Like if I say used car salesman, most people would say sleazy, untrustworthy, uh, you know, pushy, all sorts of negative things. So those are frames of reference. And so when we speak, we're triggering frames of reference in the audience and we have to be able to understand and have the self-awareness to know what frames of reference am I triggering when I speak and how do I manage what I want to trigger in the audience emotionally and intellectually so that I can keep them understanding the message that follows what that frame is. And if I set the right frame, I can control how they perceive the message and that's controlling perception and perception equals reality. So you realize just how powerful the, the art of framing is because it does really dictate what reality is. And then we, we talk about what we call a tie down and the tie down is what this means to you. And so that process when it comes together becomes a very powerful and persuasive way of speaking. But it also is built upon the first step which is getting people to speak from the heart. And so what we tell people is the goal of Amplify is to get your heart to speak in sequence. And the in sequence is the sequence I just showed you, but if we can get the heart to speak first, now that's where we have authenticity. We have people that are, that are speaking their truth, something that is most unique to them. It's the most powerful value proposition they, that they can have because nobody can copy their story. It's theirs, it's uniquely yours. We call it a signature story or your origin story. Combining all of those elements, the exploration process combined with the body language, voice inflections, all of the, the technical side of it to be able to deliver an end product, uh, we create some pretty interesting and pretty, pretty outstanding uh, transformations. And where can people find out more information about this experience? They can go to amplifymylife.com or you can go to my speaker site, uh, C. Renee, it's Renee, R-E-N-E, speak.com, C. Renee, speak.com and just click on Amplify. Amplify has two eyes. We do own both domains, so if you do it with a Y, it'll still work. But uh, amplifymylife.com. A last question. Now, you mentioned that you're on a journey, so you're not really planting a, a specific destination for the next 10 years. How are you... Um, yeah, I, I was going to say, even beyond the 10 years, like how are you thinking like legacy-wise... Uh, Hmm. What you want to be remembered for on your tombstone? Uh, this is a is phrase I came up play? with. This, this is a phrase I came up with this morning uh, that I really, I really liked. It's just like unleashing the ideas that will change the world. Mm -hmm. And I believe that there are a lot of people with great ideas that just don't know how to communicate them. And the and a lot of the world is run by people that don't have really great ideas, but know how to communicate them. And so, what if we flip the script of saying, let's teach those that have amazing ideas, but maybe weren't trained on how to communicate them. And so that to me is unleashing the ideas that will change the world. And so I think if I can help people communicate from their heart in a way that, in a sequence that the brain follows, to me, that's what I would like to be known for. Renee, thank you very much for your time. Uh, where can people follow you on social media? What's the best place? Uh, Instagram, at C. Renee Speak, or Facebook, C. Renee Speak as well and obviously LinkedIn, but Instagram's probably the, the one that has the most content on it and uh, would love, and if you follow, just send me a message, I'll follow you back. Renee, thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Keep doing what you're doing. It's a, it's a, I love what you're doing.